And we finally reach the final part of what I consider to be the finest war movie ever made. In the previous parts, we had a look at the film Waterloo. We had a look at Cross of Iron. We delved into Paths of Glory and also Daz Boot. But the time has come to unveil what I consider to be the best of the best of the best. But before I do that, I want to quickly delve into what I consider to be the three worst war films of all time. And whilst you may not agree with me on this, I do think they're pretty, pretty stinkers. And starting us off is this little gem, The Battle of the Bulge. Why does it make my list? Well, I mean, this film is so inaccurate it beggars belief. Not only was it filmed mainly in Spain, an area of Europe that looks nothing like the Ardennes, I mean, where's all the forests? But there's no snow, and the whole Ardennes offensive was done at a time when, I mean, at the time there was so much snow on the ground and the weather was so bad that there was absolutely massive amounts of cloud cover that the air superiority allies could not be used and that's missing and it just beggars belief that you would make a film about one of Germany's final offences if not the most final offensive in the West and get it so so wrong I mean it's just unbelievable this is why the Battle of the Bulge makes my list. Now, don't get me wrong, from an entertainment viewpoint, okay, it's entertaining. But if you're looking for something that is historically, well, not 100% accurate, but at least near as damn it, then this is not the film for you because it is just so inaccurate. It just makes one laugh. That is why Battle of the Bulge makes number three on my list. At number two, however, is a film that brings a shudder to my spine every time it's mentioned. Pearl Arbor. Oh my life, what were they thinking? This is a film that is meant to depict the attack by the Japanese on Pearl Arbor. Hence the name, Pearl Arbor. However, the film would have been more appropriately titled if they called it The Doolittle Raiders. Because the majority of the film is actually about the Doolittle Raid, which came after Pearl Harbor. Why don't I like this film? Well, it's firstly highly, highly propagandized. It really, really is. I mean, to the point where Ben Affleck, who plays one of the lead characters, basically a fighter pilot, is almost single-handedly gone to Britain and fought in the Battle of Britain. Now, don't get me wrong. You know, I mean, there were American fighter pilots in the RAF at the time of the Battle of Britain. The most notable of which was a Cambridge graduate called Billy Fisk. However, the way the film portrays Ben Affleck as being like single-handedly able to destroy so many German aeroplanes does not only a dishonour to those American servicemen who did fight in the Battle of Britain, but is just flag-waving for the heck of flag-waving. Don't get me wrong, visually, some of the scenes are very, very good. The attack on Pearl Harbor itself is pretty, pretty nicely done. But underlining all this is this ridiculous love story, which sort of runs through the entire movie. And it's more of a love story than it is a war film. It's a love story with a little bit of war movie involved. And for that, I just think it's a truly terrible film. And for such an important event in history, namely the attack on Pearl Harbor, again, I think this film does it a disservice. Anyway, let's move on to what I think is number one. At number one, it can only be this disastrous and truly awful war film, Inchon. Now, Inchon is basically an American-Korean film whereby it was meant to depict the the turning point of the Korean War, with, ironically, Laurence Olivier playing General MacArthur. I mean, they couldn't even get an American to play General MacArthur. And don't get me wrong, I love Laurence Olivier. I think he's a great actor, but he is no American, and he's certainly no reasonably convincing MacArthur. 
And that's just one of the many, many, many issues beyond this movie. I mean, this film is just truly shockingly bad. Although, to be fair, Laurence Olivier, being the actor that he was, does actually bring something to the movie. The rest of them are just one-dimensional, wooden cardboard cutouts with absolutely horrific dialogue. Inchon truly is a shocking movie. Uh, but if you want a good laugh one night, then you can get it. Uh, you can get the entire movie sort of free on YouTube. I'm also going to do a notable mention because I think it's worth it. And that notable mention is this highly propaganda film, The Green Berets. Now, don't get me wrong, I mean, it's fun to watch, but, I mean, it just stinks of propaganda upon propaganda. Don't forget, this film was made at the height when American society was turning against the war, and this was basically brought him to show that it's such a valiant cause and our guys are doing so well, etc, etc. And they, were, they had some big star power, John Wayne. In fact, the entire, almost the entire second season of Star Trek, the original series, was devoid of so, uh, Sulu because he was in this film. I mean, but it's a shocking movie. Historically inaccurate, everything about it is inaccurate, but it is a bit of good fun. It's not as bad, in fairness, as Inchon, but it's still a truly, truly shocking movie. So, what do I think, however, is number one? Well, for me, there is only one war movie that tops the best of the best list, and that is Stanley Kubrick's masterpiece, Full Metal Jacket. Set during the Vietnam War, this is one of the most realistic war movies out there. Okay, so the first and the second acts don't really show any war or any actual fighting, but what it does try to make you, the viewer, is be part of the process of turning a civilian into a fighting machine. And Act 1, or the training at Paris Island, is about as close as you will ever get to having the experience of what basic military training is all about. It helped that Arlie Ermey, who was previously a marine instructor during this period, was brought in as the drill instructor in Full Metal Jacket. And boy, what he brings to the table for the basic training part is gritty, mean, and above all, totally, totally real. Ermi doesn't really need to act for this part. He'd already done it for real life. And boy, does it show. The film itself starts off with the initial breaking down process of the man, the shaving of the hair, and then it follows the total dehumanization of the recruit in order to turn them into an obedient soldier. And it shows graphically how the military machine tries to achieve this in a relatively very short period of time. We are taken into the very heart of the boot camp experience, even to the point where the focus of the training shifts from private pile to private joker to private cowboy, but it's private pile that we are drawn to because it is taken, his dehumanization is taken so far that he eventually exceeds to the point of no return. Even then, however, the drill instructor still believes that the goal of making a military robot has been achieved with disastrous consequences. We then shift the action to Vietnam itself, where we're now following fully Private Joker. We had followed him during the training, but he's now the focus of attention and he's been assigned to the Marine Press Corps. Here, Joker and his company are far behind the enemy lines, meant to be reporting on how the US is winning the war, and here we start to experience the cynical side of war. Even to the point where Joker is rebuked, in part, for failing to mention how many Viet Cong had been killed in a recent action prompting his officer to say to him, we do two kinds of story, grunts who give half their pay to buy gooks books in toothpaste, hearts in minds, and combat that results in kills, winning the war. During this part of the movie, the famed Tet Offensive happens, 
and again we see war from a distance, whereby the North Vietnamese attack the Da Nang airbase and the Marines repel them rather easily, albeit from a distance and with no immediate casualties on the Marine side. We then move the action into the field, whereby Joker is now assigned to Huey alongside infantry combat marines. Here he meets up with his boot camp counterpart, Private Cowboy, whom he had made friends with earlier in the film. Again, we get to experience the cynical side of war. Firstly, with Joker being berated by a senior officer for wearing a peace symbol on his flak jacket, and then he experiences exclusion from some of Cowboy's own platoon because he is not a combat marine. For the final part, we move into Way itself and we follow the platoon who has now been joined by Joker and his junior rafter man as they experience the Battle of Way. Here the platoon comes under fire from the enemy and for the first time Joker starts to actually experience the harsh reality of war as members of the platoon are killed off one by one. With the officer down, Cowboy takes over and seeks tank support for which there is none, and then seeks to retreat, prompting the platoon to split. Those who want to rescue the downed marines and attack the enemy, and those who feel that they will also end up in the same boat. What happens next is just amazing storytelling from Kubrick, who eventually takes us to the point whereby the better trained, armed and equipped squad of US marines are literally bettered initially by a single young Vietnamese female sniper, a mere girl. We feel the tension the Marines have, it's palpable, and we the viewers are being invited to share in the questions posed to the, to the platoon, go forward or retreat. But Kubrick doesn't stop there. We are then exposed to the very, very harsh reality of war, whereby the young girl is shot, but she's not killed and now Joker faces the hardest decision of all. Kill the girl and put her out of her pain and misery or let her die in agony. The music score at this point pulls us, the viewer, in so many different directions that we feel empathy for the girl, sympathy for Joker and his decision, but also we are invited to share the views of some of the platoon to let her die in pain rather than remove her suffering. As an ex-soldier myself, Kubrick's full metal jacket takes on a totally realistic ride into the reality of military life. And we, as the viewer, are drawn into the situation along with the recruits, then soldiers. Kubrick invites us to question ourselves and how we would act. What would we do, whilst at the same time keeping the actual brutality of war initially at arm's length? It is difficult for us not to feel for Private Pyle and his journey, but also recognise that Hartman, the drill instructor, isn't how to get him or hurt him, but to prepare him and give him the necessary tools to survive. It is a gritty and well-paced film, and at times it's incredibly uncomfortable to watch. Not because of the death and destruction, but because we actually see the true dehumanisation process up close and personal. This is not your stereotypical war movie. It's not propaganda, there's no flag waving, there's no subliminal messages of greatness or romanticisation of being a soldier in war. It is rough, it is gritty. The character development is amazing and for me, Ali Ermey's portrayal of the drill instructor at the beginning and what the Marines go through is just unbelievably, truly amazing acting. Full Metal Jacket makes my list at number one because it is probably of the most accurate war movie you will ever, ever get to see. And it's just a masterpiece given to us by what can be described as probably the best director of all time, Stanley Kubrick. As a side note, and just for trivia, this entire movie was filmed in the UK. That's right. The city of Way is some of the old bomb damaged parts of East London, whereas the landscape, the countryside, is Norfolk. I mean, wow, who would have believed 
that you could get a realistic looking Vietnam landscape in the UK. Not me, that's for sure. Anyway, that has been my top five war movies with Full Metal Jacket topping the list at number one. By all means, comment and everything below. Share your thoughts. Tell me what you like. What is your favourite film? And I hope you enjoyed this. And I'll be back again soon with some more movie reviews. Not necessarily more movies. Until then, all the best.